Hello, you are watching uh, my lecture on the Odyssey books 13 through 18, part one. And this is Professor Ryan Paul from Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Thank you so much for watching. Just a brief review of where we've been in the first 12 books. Of course, Odysseus, our hero, has been lost for many years after the Trojan War. Um, while he's been gone, suitors are besetting his household, trying to marry his wife and uh, murder his son. The goddess Athena, though, has been helping Odysseus as he makes his way home. And over the last few books, he's been in the island of Phaeacia, recounting the tale of his past journeys and trials to the king and queen and their household. Book 13, Ithaca at last. Odysseus finishes his tale of travels and travails. King Alcinous and the rest of the court praise him and offer him lavish gifts as part of their hospitality and generosity. But Odysseus, having just recounted how long he's been away and all the suffering he's been through, is of course eager to continue his journey and to finally return home. And his desire is expressed in this wonderful epic simile. Can think about how Homer describes Odysseus's sadness and his longing and what he compares it to and how this communicates to his audience the suffering of Odysseus. Time and again, Odysseus turned his face toward the radiant sun, anxious for it to set, yearning now to be gone and home once more. As a man aches for his evening meal when all day long his brace of wine-dark oxen have dragged the bolted plowshare down a fallow field, how welcome the setting sun to him, the going home to supper, yes, though his knees buckle, struggling home at last. So that sense of the long labors and the work that he's done, and even though he's tired and beaten, he still feels this surge of energy and this desire to make his way home and rest at last. And so, of course, he is set off with many, many gifts from Alcinous and his fellow lords. But while he's traveling, an irresistible sleep overtakes Odysseus. And so they arrive, the Phaeacians arrive in Ithaca, and they just leave him on shore and pile up his treasures around him and make their way back home. Of course, we know that Poseidon won't be happy about this, and he talks to his brother Zeus, and here he calls Zeus father, but he doesn't mean that as in his father. It's a title of respect because Zeus is the king of the gods. So Poseidon says, Zeus, father, I will lose all my honor now among the immortals. Now there are mortal men who show me no respect. So he's fearful that the Phaeacians' defiance of his will, of his desires for Odysseus to be punished, will make the other gods mock him. But Zeus says, Earthshaker, you with your massive power, why moaning so? The gods don't disrespect you. Those mortals, if any man so lost in his strength and prowess pays you no respect, just pay him back. The power is always yours. Do what you like. So Zeus says, if you want to punish them for whatever reason, even though, of course, Zeus is king, is god of the uh, strangers and the guests, Zeus says, if you want to punish them for helping their guests just because you don't like it, do what you want. You're a god. You can do whatever you please. So in his vengeance, Poseidon destroys the returning ship as the Phaeacians are watching it sail towards them. He turns it to stone at Zeus's suggestion. And then he is planning to cast down a mountain into the port of, of the city so that they will never be able to sail out again, to block forever their port. And of course, Alcinous recalls this, knows that this is the prophecy that's to come. Knowing the prophecy of his father, Alcinous calls out, Hurry, friends, do as I say. Let us all comply. Stop our convoys home for every castaway chancing on our city. As for Poseidon, sacrifice twelve bulls to the god at once, the pick of the herds. Perhaps he'll pity us, pile no looming mountain ridge around our port. So Alcinous, they hope that they can perhaps avert the god's anger by punishing him, by uh, uh, sacrificing to him. And also note how they say, well, in order to comply with the God's will, we have to abandon our virtue of charity and hospitality. 
we have to abandon the help that we would give to other humans in order to fulfill the will of this angry God and survive ourselves. Over on Ithaca, Odysseus finally wakes, but does not recognize where he is because Athena has covered everything with a mist that makes it look strange to him. And in a, a bit of biting irony, given what we've just seen happening to the Phaeacians for helping Odysseus, he rants in his anger, thinking that they've left him in some strange land. And he even wonders if maybe they left him with all his gifts or if they didn't take some of it back. Man of misery, whose land have I lit on now? What are they here, violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? We've heard him say things like this before on previous times when he's been shipwrecked, and now, ironically, he says it about his own land, wondering if they are friendly and God-fearing or savage. And note, of course, also his he's so used to tragedy, so used to suffering and misery that he assumes this is one more trial he'll have to go through. And he asks, where can I take this heap of treasure now, and where in the world do I wander off myself? somewhat amusing. Oh, look at all this treasure I have. This is such a hassle to have to carry all this treasure around. What am I supposed to do with it now? It seems there's nothing really that can quite satisfy Odysseus or make him happy. And so Odysseus comes upon a young shepherd, who of course we know is Athena in disguise, and asks where I am. And the young shepherd says, you really don't know? Well, let me tell you where you are. You're in Ithaca. And even though he is moved to find out that he's finally back on his native land, Odysseus does not reveal his identity, instead makes up a story about who he is and where he comes from. When he hears the name of Ithaca, it's described like so. He stood on native ground at last, and he replied with a winging word to Pallas, not with a word of truth. He choked it back, always invoking the cunning in his heart. Athena is amused and pleased by Odysseus's cunning and reveals herself, says, look, it's me, Athena. I've been helping you all this time. But Odysseus, Odysseus says, I remember you were there at Troy, but what about the last 10 years? Where have you been? I've been suffering. Why haven't you helped me while I've been lost? And Athena very truthfully responds that she just couldn't help him. I could not bring myself to fight my father's brother, Poseidon, quaking with anger at you, still enraged because you blinded the Cyclops, his dear son. Even though she felt pity for Odysseus and cared for him, she couldn't go against the mightier, more powerful, more honored god, her uncle Poseidon. She could only wait until she could act behind his back. So, Athena helps Odysseus to plan his return. She warns him of the suitors and says that he needs to be careful when he goes back to the palace. And then she transforms him once again into a broken man, makes him appear old and poor and ragged so that he will not be recognized when he returns to the palace. The description of how she changes him is the inverse of how she had made him appear more beautiful when he'd first landed on the island of Phaeacia and been found by Nausicaa. She says, first I will transform you, no one must know you. I will shrivel the supple skin on your lithe limbs, strip the russet curls from your head and deck you out in rags you'd hate to see some other mortal wear. I'll dim the fire in your eyes, so shining once, until you seem appalling to all those suitors, even your wife and son you left behind at home. So this book ends with the transformation. A few questions to consider. What does the behavior of Poseidon and Zeus suggest about Greek attitudes towards gods and their morality? That is, how were the gods different from humans? How was their morality different? And what does it mean to live in a world ruled by gods like this? How are you supposed to live your life? How do you adapt to their desires, especially if their desires are, like Poseidon's, somewhat irrational or based in personal honor rather than some larger ethical system? How can one maintain human virtue, human morality, 
human ethics when it conflicts with the will of the gods? Well, as the Phaeacians seem to show us, you just have to abandon it if you want to survive. But is there a way to maintain your morality? And if so, what happens to you? Why does Odysseus once more lie about his identity when he meets Athena in the disguise of a young shepherd? What is he worried about on this new strange land? And why does Athena praise his deception when, she, when he lies? Why does she say, good job, Odysseus? Why is she impressed? And we can think about this as part of a larger theme that we've seen repeated throughout the story, a narrative element, a repeated element of disguise and reveal. Odysseus is often pretending to be one person and then revealing his identity as another, or people are mistaken as one person and then they reveal their true nature. We've seen it many times already and it will continue through the poem. What is important about that? How, does, how do these moments of disguise and reveal relate to the larger idea of the journey or the return home, the longing for what you've lost? How does that fit into and develop this, these ideas and contribute to the larger meaning of the Odyssey? Book 14, The Loyal Swineherd. So Athena sends Odysseus not to the palace, but to Eumaeus, his most loyal servant, the swineherd who cared more for Odysseus than anyone else. And Eumaeus welcomes this stranger when he sees him, as he should, and laments to the stranger the loss of his king. He is in despair, just as many others are in Ithaca. And Odysseus, of course, wants to know what Eumaeus has to say about him. So he asks, he says, tell me about this lost king of yours, your master. What was he like? And Eumaeus, of course, says many great things about him. But he says also that he thinks Odysseus is lost forever. He's never going to come back to Ithaca. Eumaeus says, my master? Well, no doubt the dogs and wheeling birds have ripped the skin from his limbs by now his life is through, or fish have picked him clean at sea and the man's bones lie piled up on the mainland, buried deep in sand. He's dead and gone, I leaving a broken heart for loved ones left behind, for me most of all, never another master kind as he. So Eumaeus is deeply distraught over the loss of his former master. In his disguise, Odysseus says, I've heard of this man, Odysseus, that you say, and I'm going to tell you he's coming back. And in fact, he goes, I won't simply say it on my oath. I swear Odysseus is on his way. And he can, of course, make this promise because he is Odysseus. But Eumaeus doesn't believe him. He says, you must be wrong, or in fact, you're lying. Eumaeus cannot be convinced, and repeatedly, no matter what Odysseus says, to try to convince him that his master is coming home, Eumaeus says, no, you're wrong, I know you're wrong. When asked about his identity, Odysseus once more displays his creativity and cunning and concocts another story about who he is. He says he was the bastard son of a king who made himself wealthy and honored through his hard work and, and good business sense and, and intelligence. He fought at Troy, but then was captured in Egypt while sacking a city there. And then after traveling from Egypt, he was shipwrecked on Thesprotia, and is, it's there that he heard about Odysseus and Odysseus's plan to return. And leaving Thesprotia, he was enslaved, but then ultimately escaped, and that's how he found his way to Ithaca. Eumaeus, however, still doubts Odysseus, even after hearing about where he heard the story of his master's return. And we can see in this response just how upsetting this loss of Odysseus is because it's not just that he's dead, but it's that his memory, his glory has been sullied. I know you'll never persuade me what you say about Odysseus, a man in your condition. Who are you, I ask you, to lie for no good reason? Well, I know the truth, 
of my good Lord's return, how, what, how the gods detested him with a vengeance, never letting him go under fighting Trojans or die in the arms of loved ones once he'd wound down the long coil of war. Then all united Achaea would have raised his tomb, and he'd have won his son great fame for years to come. But now the whirlwinds have ripped him away, no fame for him. So the fact that Odysseus has just been lost out there means his fame has been lost, his glory has been lost. But still Eumaeus is generous, as he should be. He slaughters a hog and makes an offering to Zeus and shares his food, the finest of the cut, with his guest. And Odysseus even tests the hospitality a little further, telling a story about once when he was cold. And so Eumaeus lends him his winter coat so that he can be warm as they sleep through the evening in the, in the swineherd's shack. And that's the end of Book 14. Now, depending on your translation, you may have noticed uh, an odd little stylistic choice in that unusually Homer talks directly to Eumaeus the swineherd addresses him as you rather than as him and so some have suggested some scholars have suggested that this means that the poet or the narrator of this poem is displaying some kind of special fondness for Eumaeus as a liking for this character above others the way authors sometimes do like one character more than another so what is it about Eumaeus that might engender such fondness? Why is it that he might be a particularly um, ple pleasing character that the poet has a, has a love for, a favoritism for? Speaking also of Eumaeus, what is significant about the level of despair that he exhibits and his insistence, no matter what, that Odysseus is dead? What is this showing us about what it means to experience pain and loss and how despair can affect us psychologically, the way it can change your life and your perception of the world around you? How does it contribute to the ongoing portrait of the nature of pain and loss? Further questions, thinking about Odysseus's encounter with Eumaeus and the reception he receives, the swineherd's generosity, their discussion, how does it compare to Odysseus's previous adventures? How does it compare with what's happened to him before? In particular, think about how Eumaeus's hospitality compares with the great kings who's, who've welcomed Odysseus and the kings who welcomed Telemachus. Or compare Eumaeus as a servant to Odysseus's old servants, the sailors, for example, that uh, were lost when he was at sea after the Trojan War. How, do, how does Eumaeus function as a different sort of character to contrast with, to give us a new perspective on those other events? And how does the story that Odysseus concoct in this book about his false identity, how does it compare or contrast to his actual adventures? So you can think about similar events or themes, similar characters, similar travels uh, and challenges that he experienced, that he had in his false stories as in his real stories. And think about how Odysseus, despite the fact that he's lying, is also in some way revealing something truthful about his experience. What is it that Odysseus tells the truth about? How does this reveal something about how he's experienced his sufferings, what they've done to him, how they've changed him? or transformed him, if at all. Book 15, The Prince Sets Sail for Home. So Athena comes to Telemachus in a vision and chides him, says, what are you doing out here? You need to return home. You've been away too long. Ironic, given that she was the one who told him to leave, but now she's telling him to go back. And she warns him also of the suitors, that they're going to ambush him, so he needs to be careful. And she says, when you get there, don't go to the palace, go to Eumaeus the swineherd. So we see Athena starting to set things up for the conclusion to the book, to the poem. Hearing this, Telemachus is ready to go immediately in the middle of the night, but 
Pisistratus, Nestor's son, who has been with him for the last little bit, says, we can't just leave without telling Menelaus we're going. We can't depart in the middle of the night. There's a proper way to do things. Menelaus is going to want to send us off. He says, morning will soon be here. So wait, I say, wait till he loads our chariot down with gifts. The hero Atreides, Menelaus, the great spearman, and gives us warm salutes and sees us off like princes. That's the man a guest will remember all his days, the lavish host who showers him with kindness. So this almost obligation to receive gifts from Menelaus, from one's host, uh, and just as they are obliged to give them. Telemachus agrees, of course, to, to wait till the morning, and then he says, Menelaus, we're ready to go. We need to go home quickly before the suitors can do more damage. And Menelaus, of course, hears this and says, I understand, yes, let's hurry. And so Menelaus hurries to prepare a lavish feast and give rich gifts to Telemachus before he leaves. So this does all happen quickly, but we still get this um, extended description of all the food that's being prepared, all the rich gifts that are gonna be given to Telemachus that he's gonna load him down with. Um, and this may seem very materialistic and greedy, um, or Pisistrata saying, let's wait until he gives us all the gifts, but it's also part of the protocol, part of the behavior. You have to accept the gifts. It's what they do. It's what the host does to show how great they are. And to deny the gifts would be to deny their greatness. They leave Sparta and Menelaus's palace, but they still have to go back to Pylos, to Nestor's city. And Telemachus says, look, I don't have time to go in with your dad. He's going to keep us there forever with his hospitality. So is there any way that we can get past this? And Pisistratus says, just go straight to the ship. Don't go to Nestor's palace. I'll go and tell my father that you've already gone, because otherwise you'll be stuck here forever with his hospitality. Climb aboard now, fast, he says. Muster all your men before I get home and break the news to father. With that man's overbearing spirit, I know it, know it all too well. He'll never let you go. He'll come down here and summon you himself. He won't return without you, believe me. In any case, he'll fly into a rage. So this somewhat humorous idea that Nestor's going to be so angry that Telemachus didn't come to receive his gifts, that he'll fly into a rage. We see just how important this hospitality is. It's more than just friendliness. It's about setting one's identity and establishing one's greatness and showing proper respect to those who are higher up. And as Telemachus is preparing to leave, he's approached by a man. We learn a story of this man from Argos, and his name is Theoclamenus. And he's a prophet who's been cast out because apparently he killed one of his countrymen. And so he's a fugitive. Telemachus, he asks Telemachus for help, and Telemachus says, of course, I will welcome you on board. I will aid you as a fugitive. Back on Ithaca, Odysseus is still with the swineherd, and he further tests Eumaeus' hospitality, wants to know about what happened to uh, his own parents um, and so forth. And so he wants to see if Eumaeus will let him stay and continue to talk to him. So he asks about what happened to the mother and father of Odysseus, and the swineherd very tragically recalls the death of Odysseus' mother and how fond he was of her as well. Of Odysseus's deceased mother, Eumaeus says, when she was alive, heart sick as she was, it always moved me to ask about her, learn the news. She'd reared me herself and right beside her daughter, just the two of us growing up together, the woman tending me almost like her child. Her mother, that is the girl's mother, the, this is the Odysseus's mother, decked me out in cloak and shirt, good clothing she wrapped about me, gave me sandals, sent me here, this farm. She loved me from the heart. So Eumaeus also misses Odysseus's mother and misses her in just the same way as Odysseus does, as a son misses the woman who raised him. Odysseus then asks after Eumaeus's story, what, what is your story? Where did you come from? Presumably he knows this himself, but as a stranger, he politely asks. 
And so we learn that Eumaeus was the son of a man named Cetesius, who was the ruler of the island Cyre, and he was kidnapped by Phoenician pirates who, who seduced his Phoenician nursemaid and eventually was sold to Laertes, Odysseus's father. Odysseus is moved by this story, or at least he says he's moved, and but at the same time, he also points out to Eumaeus just how lucky he is. He says, Eumaeus, so much misery, you've moved my heart. True, but look at the good fortune Zeus sends you, hand in hand with the bad. After all your toil, you reach the house of a decent, kindly man, who gives you all you need in meat and drink. He's seen to that, I'd say. It's a fine life you lead. So Odysseus says, I I'm sorry for your suffering, but hey, look where you are and look at your great master, even though he's lost. Look what benefits you've had despite this early suffering. Finally, at the end of the book, we go back to Telemachus, who has landed at Ithaca, and they see a sign, a hawk with a dove in its hands and its claws. And Theoclymenus interprets it as a favorable sign, says this means that your family, your bloodline will always rule on Ithaca. So do not worry about the suitors. You will triumph over them. And with that in mind, Telemachus then sets off for the swineherd, where, as we'll see in the next book, he will meet, finally, his returned father. Some questions. First, why do you think the focus in this book, and in some of the others, but particularly in this book, on the excesses of hospitality, just how excessive it is, all the gift giving and, and feasting and so forth? Um, so you might think about who Homer's audience was. He is writing in a poetic style, an educated poetic style, but that doesn't mean that only the nobles and educated knew him and knew his work. These were popular stories that were familiar to many. So he probably had listeners and, when it was written, readers from all walks of society. So the question we can ask is, how does he appeal to all of the listeners? Is it appealing to the common soldier just to hear about the great general and how all the stupid soldiers underneath him betrayed him and caused him problems? How do you appeal to those common soldiers, the common man, their experiences? Certainly they do want to hear about the heroes, but they also want things that reflect their own life. So in reading this poem overall, in this book in particular, what does Homer give to the nobles to latch on to, to enjoy? And what does he give to the commoners? And how is Homer able to write a poem that is in some ways appealing to all aspects of his society, at least all male aspects of his audience? Just a few more questions, again, about hospitality first. What does hospitality do for the person who gives gifts as well as the receiver? We know the person who receives it, they get some obvious benefits, but what are the what are the giver's benefits? And what are the obligations on the receiver? Once more, think about the hospitality of those we've seen in other poems, other parts of the poem, Menelaus, Nestor, Alcinus, etc. How does their hospitality compare to Eumaeus's? How does the situation, the encounter between Odysseus in the swineherd's hut compare to Telemachus's experience with Menelaus and Nestor. Are there any ironies there, as well as similarities? And then finally, consider Eumaeus's story and how it compares to the many other narratives of trial and travel that we've seen, both from Odysseus, true and false, from other people. Think about how you might, what comparisons you can find, contrasts, how they further develop other themes that we see in the story, and perhaps most importantly, if these are in some way symbolic or representative or universal narratives, these are stories of trial and suffering that in some way everyone's supposed to be able to identify with. So what are the universal characteristics of suffering, the universal aspects of loss and pain that they capture and convey? So that's the end of part one. The next video lecture is the Odyssey books 13 through 18, part two.